Well, hey, this is Ministry Briefing. I'm Matt Steen. Joining me is Todd Rhodes and, and David Marquette, um, author of the book Turn the Ship Around, a story of his time on the USS Santa Fe, a fast attack sub, where he uh, turned the culture from the worst performing sub in the Navy to, to the best performing sub in the Navy. And so, David, welcome. Thanks for, thanks for spending some time with us today. Good to be here. And, and maybe we can just start off with, tell us a little bit about the story of the, of the Santa Fe and, and your experience commanding it. Right. So uh, first, you need to understand that I grew up in a culture where we were very good at controlling people. Leadership was about getting people to do stuff, to do what you wanted them to do. And I was really good at following instructions, and I was really good at giving instructions. And my idea was if you gave good instructions, you had a good outcome. If you gave great instructions, you had a great outcome. And so because I was so good, uh, I got promoted to the Navy ranks. And I, here I was at 38. I was going to go command a nuclear-powered submarine, which was really a, just a, a dream for me. It was really all I really wanted. It's a great job. Uh, and so for a year, I trained to take command of one submarine, the USS Olympia. At the very last minute, uh, they, they shifted the plans and they said, okay, you're going to go to the Santa Fe instead. Now, the Santa Fe it was the submarine that we joked about, about how screwed up they were during that year training process. So, like, oh, those poor guys on the Santa Fe. And now I, like, was those poor guys. <laughs> I was petrified. The other thing that happened was the Santa Fe was a newer kind of submarine. So all that equipment that I had learned for the Olympia – was was different. I mean, the, you know, the basics were the same. You know, you know, they had a steering wheel and wheels. You know, to make the car analogy, but you know, the the the, the screens were different. The buttons were in different places. That kind of thing. So, and by the way, it was the worst performing, worst morale, worst retention submarine in the fleet. And the reason I was going there was because the previous captain had had enough and just quit. So oh. I didn't I didn't know what to do. I go down to the ship and. I knew, I mean, like it was obvious I was no longer the expert, but the habits die hard. And so I start giving these orders. And what happens is I give an order, which is impossible to carry out. I don't know. Um, and it's an order to, to speed up on this backup motor that we were running on. And the office of the deck, who'd been there for two years, ordered it anyway. And when it came to light, the crew, crew member brought it up that, hey, Captain, this is, you know, there's no setting. Um, it was really embarrassing, but I asked, I asked this guy, I said, well, you know, why did you, did you know? I said, well, yes, sir. I was like, look at me straight in the eye. <laughs> well, why, why did you order it? And everyone knows what, what he said. He said, because you told me to. And it's at that moment I realized that, I said, oh, my goodness. It's all about getting people to do stuff, and they're going to do whatever I say. And if it's right, good. If it's wrong, bad. And, and on a nuclear-powered submarine, hundreds of feet underneath the ocean, driving around a nuclear reactor, you, you're going to die. Because I was trained for a different submarine, and they were trained to do what, I, do what, do what they were to, told to do. So we got everyone together, and we said, hey, we're, what are we going to do here? And they came up. We talked about it for a while. One guy said, you know what? There's only one way out of this, Captain. You just need to stay quiet. You need to shut up. <laughs> Every bone in my body was like, that's not what captains do. I mean, you know, we've all seen the movie and you stand tall on the quarter deck and that kind of thing. Yeah, you know, I was like, you know, I was like Russell Crowe out there. I was amazing. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought about it, and you know, I said, this guy's really right. He's right. And so at that moment, I, I vowed never to give another order. The only order I would give was I would give the final order to launch um, a weapon because that would result in killing people. And that was something that I didn't feel um, I could give, put on anyone's conscience but mine. I mean, that was my, right. my job as a captain. But in the Navy, there are a whole list of other things that the captains normally order, submerging the ships, servicing the ships, starting up the reactor, shutting down the, you know, going on and on and on, loading torpedoes. And so what we did is we replaced it with intent. So the guy stopped asking permission. They would say, Captain, I intend to submerge the ship. And not Captain request permission to submerge the ship. Submerge the ship. Submerge the ship. I. Um, 
And it kind of sounds like a small nuance, but it was really, really, really powerful because now the ownership of, of, of all these things rested in them. It was in them. You know, and I can't tell you how hard it was as a leader to go out in the control room. I would know the right answer. I would know we needed to submerge. You know, we got to get underwater and we got to get someplace. So, uh, modern submarines, we go faster underwater than, than on the surface. Um, and, you know, I would, but I wouldn't say it. I would just look and say, hey, what, what do you think we should be doing right now? And they'd have to, you know, figure it out. But uh, what happened was, then they cascaded down to their crew. So pretty soon the guys below them started thinking like them. And then pretty soon, you know, all the way back in the engine room, the guys thinking like the captain. And I think this was one of the reasons, uh, one, one, thing, one thing that I'm really, that gives me particular satisfaction is 10 of my guys were selected to be captains of submarine. Wow. And the average is typically two to three. Oh, and wow. I think, yeah, the reason was because they were thinking like captains back when they were junior officers and department heads. So it was natural for the Navy to um, promote them. We kind of make this mistake. It's like, you'll, you know, you, we'll, we'll make you a, a leader and then we'll train you to be a leader. No, you have to act and practice being a leader and thinking like a leader and then we'll make you a leader. And that's essentially what happened throughout all the ranks on the submarine. So, um, why don't I just sort of truncate there and start having a dialogue because I could go, go on and on. There's nuances there to talk about in the book and how you screw that up. But basically that was it. What I discovered was that leadership means giving control, not taking control. Leadership means making leaders, not attracting followers. Leadership is measured by what happens after you leave and embedding whatever goodness they have, you have in your brain, whatever genius you have in your people and the practices of the organization. So they they go and do great things. You know, not like, oh, Mark Hayes named himself on my nothing. Sure, sure. David, that's, that's a, a great insight. Um, you know, most of our most of our uh, viewers and, and watchers are involved in uh, church ministry. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, it was a temporary fade out, but I got you. Looks, looks like we're going to edit this one, Todd, so you yeah. might want to start your question over again. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> well, uh, Thanks for that, David. You know, a lot of our audience are uh, church pastors and church leaders, and a lot of them probably feel like they're a captain on uh, the Santa Fe <laughs> because they've got they've either inherited or they've they've found themselves smack dab in the middle of trying to lead an organization um, that, quite frankly, other people are kind of poking fingers at and laughing at because it's so disorganized, hasn't had a good leader for for decades. Um, so how would you, I know the book talks about how you take your experience and, and move that into organizations and leaders. I mean, what would be some good experience uh, that you could pass on to, say, a new pastor that's kind of just taken over the Santa Fe? What, what advice would you give him? Okay, so one of the things that I learned, um, like I'm now, do, now out in the commercial world doing this kind of thing, and one of the things I learned is that there's this underlying precondition, which I didn't. I, I took for granted on the submarine because by the time guys got to the submarine, they already had this. The underlying precondition is trust. Mm. And, and, and what happens is when I say trust, it means that I believe whatever you tell me, not necessarily that I agree that it's correct. So if you say we should start the reactor or we should submerge the ship or we should have a bake sale this weekend, that I believe that you believe that in your best of heart, best of intention, that you think that's right, that you're not trying to trick me into some bad behavior. Mm -hmm. But we separate that from the idea of, is, is that really the right thing to do? So let's just have a temp tempestuous discussion about the merits of the bake sale and decouple it from this, well, don't trust me sort of issue. Now, I think there's so, so uh, there are a couple things that you can do to build trust. One of the things is understanding that we have clarity of purpose, that we're all sort of pointing in the same direction. And this is one of the things that we spent a lot of time working on. On the submarine, it's pretty um, easy. We have a pretty clear mes message to defend the Constitution and do good by people who want to embrace democracy. But it tends to get lost. We don't talk about it. We don't know how to talk about it. We're in day-to-day -day work. We don't 
we don't couple what we do to this this higher this higher purpose. And so reminding people of the higher purpose, and if there's this debate on the higher purpose, let's have the debate, let's agree to what it is, let's make it public, because what will happen then is the people who don't agree, they're going to leave, and you don't, want, you don't want them anyway. But the people who understand your higher purpose will be attracted to you, and that's, well, that's what you want. Now, once you get people understanding what our higher purpose is, our clarity of organization, Again, you know, and, and you give someone the authority to say you're in charge of this program, you're in charge of the choir, you're in charge. I'm, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what kind of decisions that the people have to make, but you're in charge of these different programs. You're in charge of, the, you know, Sunday school. You're in charge of how we're going to talk to to um, the ministry this this week. What 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 are the messages over the next 52 weeks? They may not come up with the same thing you do, but the fact that they're in charge of it and, and you both know that your hearts are in it and going in the same direction is really, really powerful. And sometimes you say, you know what, that's so far off, uh, I'm going to have to put my foot down as the leader. I get to veto that. But a lot of times I found myself saying, you know, it's not quite what I would have done, but he owns it. Because when I say do what I say, you absolve people of responsibility. It's like, well, hey, it didn't come out so good, but on you, buddy, not me. Well, my idea. Yeah. Uh, so it's a, this idea of giving people control allows you to hold them, uh, makes them responsible, allows you to hold them accountable. If they're just doing your what you do, there's no there's no way you can enforce accountability. And this is sort of the flip side, the ugly flip side of this idea. I mm-hmm. want to be in control. Great, but there's an accountability piece that goes with it. So, um, so David, I want to get back to something you said. Um, earlier in, in our conversation about redefining success as you know, not necessarily being related to strictly what you do during your time in an organization, but what happens in that organization after you leave. Right. Um, in your book, it talks about how, you know, as a commander in the Navy, you're not ranked on what happens after you leave the next guy is. And so it makes it easy to, right. to not think about that. But tell us, tell us a little bit more about, about that. Right. So here, here's what I think. If you, if you look up a lot of definitions of leadership, I think they're basically definitions of accomplishment. They're getting things done, using people to get things done. That's basically the, the you know, some nuance of that. We, we flipped it around. So in other words, we're, instead of exploiting people to make the organization better, we're going to exploit the organization to make better people. We're going to exploit the fact that, you know, exploit maybe – not the right feel of the word, but we're going to take advantage of the fact that we have this, this meeting every week where people come together, where we're like-minded, you know, we have resources, and, that we're, and the output is going to be better people. That's the first flip. The second flip is, since the, since the objective is to make better people uh, and to make people better lives, it's not about necessarily what I accomplished during my three years as the captain or my three years as the head of this, this particular uh, church parish. So it's, it's about what my people accomplish when I'm gone, what they can do. Uh, so I think it's like one of the recent cases is the issue of Steve Jobs and Apple, which is no doubt a visionary technical genius, um, but the sort of in my book, and, and some people call him a tremendous leader, my book, the jury's out, because if he were a great leader, then the genius that he has in his head, had in his head, would be somehow embedded into the personality of Apple, of the Apple employees, and of the way they do business at Apple, and it will show up 10 years from now. Are they still putting out these great products? If right. Jobs was a genius, he was, you know, he was a brilliant technician, et cetera. But he wasn't, a, he wasn't a good leader because it didn't become sustainable. It wasn't translatable. So we all can think of people who have started movements which have gone on long past the, their tenure here on Earth. Those people are great leaders. Yeah. That's, that's, that's fantastic. It's getting back to this idea of reproducing yourself as leadership, not, you know, leading, leading the charge yourself. That's... 
That's powerful. Well, David, thank you for your time today. We really appreciate you taking the chance to, to speak with us and share some of your wisdom with our with our viewers. The book is called um, Turn the Ship Around, and the link is below. You can pick it up at Amazon. And, and I'll be honest, this is a book that I have bought and given away a great deal um, to the point where I think I, you know, I was telling him, I think I, I'm funding David's kids college education which yeah. i'm sure you don't mind so you need to buy more matt <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll get right on that thank you very much so thank you